Mark 10, verse 17, God's word says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. This is God's word, and when God's word is read, God speaks. All good people get to heaven, right? You probably know that me and sports don't go very well together. I've never been any good at sports. Uh, it just doesn't work for me. Apart from a brief flirtation with badminton 25 years ago. As ever, needing exercise, I joined a badminton class at the local night school. And I was really surprised that after a couple of weeks, I found I actually enjoyed it. No one was more surprised than me. And when the course finished, I, I was teaching. I asked one of my uh, one of my colleagues at the school I was teaching at if, if, if she fancied playing some time, and she said yes. So every Thursday lunchtime, we would go into the assembly hall, we'd set up a net, and we would we would have a couple of games. And you know what? I won every single time <laughs> for a whole year. I won. It's true. This is true. I won at sports. Those words never come from my mouth. I won at sports. So I, I started to think to myself, maybe I'm not so bad at sports after all. Maybe I should give something else a go. So I asked a guy at our church uh, if he fancied a game one night, because I, I knew he played a little. So one night we went to a local sports centre and I was feeling pretty confident <laughs> you know what happened don't you he absolutely hammered me he absolutely humiliated me he stood in the center of the court he take one step to his right whack it one step to the left whack it and he had me running all over the place absolutely breathless i was rubbish i was totally humiliated and i learned a really important lesson that night and the lesson was how good you are depends on who you are comparing yourself to. I learned that from badminton. And in Mark chapter 10, this young man learns exactly the same lesson. He learns how good you are depends on who you're comparing yourself to. So this man comes up to Jesus and he wants to know, how to get to heaven and like most people he assumes it's all to do with being good do good things in this life and god will naturally be delighted to throw open those pearly gates and let you in we tend to think good teacher he says and jesus picks him up straight away and says hang on a minute no one is good except god no one is good. No one is good. Surely that can't be right. I, I know lots of good people. Most of the people in my family are good. And I, I'm sure the people in your family are good too. Most of my friends are good. Otherwise, I wouldn't be friends with them. And of course, in a church, we only have 
good people, don't we? But Jesus wants the young man to know, and he wants me and you to know as well, that when you compare goodness, if you're comparing yourself to God, then there's a massive gap between you. There's a massive gap between you and a holy God who is totally separate from sin. Because the truth is, how, you know, how good you are depends on who you are comparing yourself to. It doesn't seem to be picking up very much. How good you are depends on who you're comparing yourself to. So Jesus turns the man's attention to the Ten Commandments. They, as many of you know, are a set of laws given to Moses on top of a mountain about 1400 years before Jesus walked on the earth. And Jesus quoted them in Mark chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus said to the young man, you know the commandments, don't you? You know those commandments God gave Moses? Well, you know about them. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. How are you doing with them, says Jesus? And the young man clearly thinks to himself, get in, I've done I've ticked every one of those boxes. I've done every one of those since I was a child. Jesus, if that's all I need to get into heaven, then I'm on my way. But hang on a minute. How many commandments were there? There were ten. And how many commandments did Jesus quote? Six. <laughs> and the point was, the point was, the missing four when Jesus quoted the six and missed out the four, ones like, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall worship the Lord your God alone, Jesus quoted the six to draw attention to the other four, so that the young man would say, huh? I've kept those ones, but I'm missing out on these ones. They're deliberately missing because the, Jesus wants the young man to work out for himself which ones are missing, and therefore, which ones he's been breaking. And to prove the point, Jesus shatters the young man's smugness by saying, verse 21, one thing you lack, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. Jesus looked at him and he loved him as he said this. Gently and lovingly, Jesus showed him the commandments that he hadn't been keeping. You shall have no other gods before me. And the sad truth is, for this young man, his money was his God. And he could not let go. What about you? Have you any idols not that you worship down, work, not that you bow down to them not, nothing that you worship as you would think but do, is there anything that's so precious to you that you could never let it go if you're a parent then you'll have heard the words mommy look at me daddy look what I can do and it might be it might be a painting where you have to ask them what it is it might be a cartwheel, or it might be learning to ride a bike, because it doesn't stop when kids leave primary school. It carries on through high school, through university, and into our adult's life. Can any of you relate to a 40-year-old saying, Mummy, look at me, I've got promotion at work. Can any of you relate to a 50-year-old saying, Daddy, look what I can do, when you've completed an extension on your house? Or a 60 year old who plays guitar in front of people. Look what I can do. Aren't I good? Won't you value me? Won't you love me? Look how clever I am. Says all of us. Says all of us. Because we all get our identity, our sense of value from what we've achieved and through what we own. Every teenager 
who has to have an iPhone, who has to wear Nike trainers, will tell you that they get their value from the things that they own. And this, this rich young man in the story, he gained his sense of self-worth through the amount of hard cash that was available to him and he would not let it go. In the film Chariots of Fire, about the brilliant Scottish athlete Eric Liddell, who prematurely retired from world-class athletics to become a missionary in China. Great biography, great Christian man. One of his main rivals in the 1924 Olympics in Paris was a man called Harold Abrams. Abrahams. And Harold Abrahams was asked, why are you training so hard? You have absolutely flogging yourself to death in your training. You're going over the top. And Harold Abrahams replied, when I go, when I, when I bend down to start the 100-yard sprint, because it was 100 yards in those days, when I bend down to do the 100-yard sprint, I've got 10 lonely seconds to justify my entire existence. I've got 10 seconds to justify my entire existence. Mum, will you love me if I win? Daddy, look how well I've done. Friends, look how well I've done. Will you value me? Will you love me? Will you give me, will you attribute to me some worth? He looked at athletics to give meaning to his life. There's a guy called Ernest Brecker, Ernest Becker, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Denial of Death. He wrote, our need for worth is so powerful that whatever we base our identity and value upon, we essentially deify it. In other words, it becomes our God with a small g. Whatever, our, our, our need for worth is so powerful that whatever we base our identity and value upon, we make it our God. And if you build your life on anything except the God who made you and loves you, then you're building your life upon sand, aren't you? If you build your life upon anything except the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock, and you're building your life on sand. It may be your career. It may be your social status. It, it may be your physical looks. It may be your family, your hobbies, your possessions. But all of these things, if you build your life on them, they will eventually let you down. Every one of them, good though they may be, if we make them an ultimate thing, they will always let you down. So let me ask you a question. When you put your head on your pillow before you go to sleep, what do you dream about? When you put your head on your pillow before you go to sleep, what are you dreaming about? Is it an idol? Is it something that you've made more precious than God? If so, you're building your life upon sand. The Lord our God said in the second commandment, you shall have no idols and you must worship me alone. If anything is at the centre of your life instead of almighty God, then you, you're just like this young man in the story who, who claimed to be good. But Jesus quickly proved that he was lacking. The rich young man went to Jesus asking about eternal life and he went away sad because he couldn't let go of the things of this world. The things that promise so much but deliver so little. Jesus challenged him to choose between God and money. And he made his decision, didn't he? He chose his God. And he walked away from Jesus. And Jesus watched him. Jesus watched him walk away. We all have a choice to make, don't we? 
Jesus never forced anyone to worship him. This, this rich young man, he was so poor that all he had was his money. That's tragic, isn't it? A friend of mine, a good friend of mine, is, uh, has a son who's in sixth form. And this son wants to become an actor. And so, instead of, he's, a, he's applying to one or two universities, but what he really has got his heart set upon is going to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. He's aiming high because he's got big dreams. He's got confidence in his acting ability and he is aiming very high. The audition process, I checked online, the audition process to get into the Guildhall School of Music and Drama is this. First of all, you should prepare three contrasting dramatic monologues of your choice. One from Shakespeare or another Elizabethan playwright, one from a modern play and a second one from a modern play that's got to be very different in character. Oh, and then you have to sing a short song unaccompanied. And if you get through that stage, you go home and then next week you'll get a letter telling, if you, telling you if you got through that stage. And the next week you will have to go back again for a second audition. And then a week or two later you'd have to go through a third audition and see if you get through that. Each one getting more and more difficult to assess the student's acting ability. Three rounds of auditions to get into drama school. And this, this, th th this friend of mine, his son, is prepared to do all that because we are, we're, he's prepared to go through this audition process to fulfill his dreams. We're, we're used to earning our success, aren't we? We're used to working hard to achieve something. And going back to this rich young man in the Bible passage, the first thing he said to Jesus was, Master, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted to earn his success. He genuinely believed he was fulfilling all of God's laws and maybe, maybe there was still just one more hoop to jump through. He wanted to be told what he needed to do. <laughs> and when Jesus told him what to do, he didn't like the answer, did he? The rich young man knew that there was a gap between him and Almighty God and he was prepared to do something extra on top of his good moral behaviour to get there. And so it is for, for all of us. There's a gap between us and God. Imagine the gap between us and God is a ladder. Let's call it a morality ladder. Okay? Let's call the gap between us and God a morality ladder. Now, not can't see that for the sunshine, can you? There's a picture of a ladder there, folks, reaching up to heaven. At the top is God in heaven. On the bottom rung are people like mass murderers and Adolf Hitler. Okay, we know they are evil people there on the very, very bottom rung. Who should, where, where do you think Mother Teresa would go? If there were ten steps, we'd probably put Mother Teresa on, on step eight, wouldn't we? Huh? Maybe we'd put Cliff Richards or Billy Graham on step seven. Maybe we'd put Princess Diana on step seven. You know, people who are really good and well known for it. What about you? Where would you go? Would you put yourself on step eight along with Mother Teresa? Would you st step seven? Are, are, you, are you about the same as Cliff? Or what would it be five or six? You know, where, where, where would you go yourself? The thing is though, whatever step you're on, there's still a gap, isn't there? There's still a gap between you and heaven. You're not there yet. There are still steps to climb. Which takes us back to the rich young man's question. Master, what must I do? What must I do to climb the next couple of steps to get up the morality ladder? How do I climb it? Because there's still a gap. Whenever I go to a 
go to a, to, a, to a gig, to watch a band, I get chatting with somebody. Down here, the door has been opened so easily because I start chatting with somebody, I, I often get the response, you're not from around these parts, are you? I can tell by your voice. Thankfully, it's a while since anybody said, oh, you're from the valleys, aren't you? I said, no, I'm from Newcastle. Oh, really? What are you doing in the Midlands? I came for work. Most people move house for work, don't you? Oh, what do you do? And so I tell them I'm a church minister, and I, and I get the response, you're a what? And which immediately followed up by, I'm not religious myself, mind. Always, I'm not religious myself. And you know what I'm going to say to that, don't you? Neither am I, he says confidently. I'm not religious either. Eh, what does that mean? How can you be a church minister and not religious? What do you mean? It opens the door for me to tell them that religion, the word religion is spelt with two letters. D-O. The word religion is spelt do. Religion means you have to do something to climb that morality ladder to God. And the problem is, you never know if you've done enough. It's like, it's, it's like a, a, a sales rep who has to go out and reach his targets on his sales, but the boss never tells him what the target is. He never has comfort in his heart to know if he's reached his target when he gets home at night. You don't know what you've got to do to climb that morality ladder. Can we ever do enough to tip the balance in our favour so that God is pleased with us? And the answer is no, you cannot. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, we all have sinned. Every last one of us. We all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Which means that on the morality ladder, got an awfully long way still to get up to the top. No matter how much you do, you'll never work your way up to God's standards. So if religion is spelled D-O, do something, what about biblical Christianity? Biblical Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It's done. Biblical Christianity is spelled done which means that we can't do anything by ourselves, but the Lord Jesus has done everything for us. Absolutely everything necessary for us to get to heaven through his death on the cross. Biblical Christianity is spelled done. D-O-N-E, done by Jesus. He died on the cross so that we don't have to. We don't have to. And the worst thing of all, our worst sin, is that we have not acknowledged God as our king. We've made ourselves king. That's the greatest sin. We've made ourselves the centre of the world. Which we're not. And so, it's right to come God humbly to receive, ask for his gift of forgiveness and follow his leadership. And when, he, when we do that, he will welcome us into his family and change us from the inside out. This is a wonderful God who is rich in mercy. But the young man in the story didn't wait long enough to find out. He walked away. Jesus watched him. He walked away and Jesus let him. How tragic. Folks, don't make the same mistake. Do not make the same mistake. Don't ever walk away from the Lord Jesus who loves you so much. This is our default position, isn't it? We always want to do something to bridge the gap. But let me draw your attention to the, to the, the, the section just before the young man walked up to Jesus. We're still in Mark chapter 10. We read from verse 17 before. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13, just four verses before. If the young man had only come up to Jesus a few minutes earlier, he would have seen this. Mark 10, 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. 
When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, he put his hands on them, and he blessed them. If only the young man had turned up a few minutes earlier, he would have seen this. Now in the first century here, children were certainly loved by their parents, but they weren't valued. They were seen as a burden on, on the family be until they were old enough to go and work. They had no status of their own. They had nothing to offer the parents while they were young and dependent, and they certainly had nothing to offer Jesus. None of them had anything to offer to Jesus when they were brought forward by the parents. Not one of them had done anything to, to deserve his love and his blessing and his welcome. Not one of them. But Jesus welcomed them anyway. It's called grace, isn't it? It's called grace, receiving what you do not deserve. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The children didn't earn acceptance by Jesus, but he welcomed them anyway. That's called grace. This was the answer to the young man's question about how to receive eternal life. Receive it as a gift. Yesterday morning, Lynn and I had a really exciting time. We took we took two of our grandchildren, actually a third one tagged along as well. We took we, two of our grandchildren got birthdays this week, so we took them shopping. They go to tennis lessons, so we went to buy them a, a tennis racket each. That was that was very exciting. Now imagine if when the, we we'd given them the, the birthday presents, they unwrapped them and said, "Oh, it's a tennis racket." Just what they've chosen, you know. It's a tennis racket. How fantastic! That's lovely. How much are we, your granddad? How much? How much do you owe me? You don't owe me anything. It's 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 a gift. I bought it and I want to give it to you. Have you earned it? No. Do you deserve it? Sometimes. It's called grace, receiving what you do not earn. They, 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 the one who's three, even the one who's five, they haven't earned a gift. But because we love them, we're happy to give them a gift. And so it is with God. If the free gift of grace by Almighty God is available for all of us, given freely, not because we've earned it, but because he loves you. Because he loves you. We have to receive it. Getting into the kingdom of God is not achieved by doing anything at all. It's a free gift. It's not about getting what you've earned because what you've earned is condemnation for your sin and separation from God for all of eternity because of our selfishness and rebellion against God. But we receive God's gift of forgiveness we receive God's gift of grace, freely given by him, paid for by the Lord Jesus on the cross. God's undeserved gift to us is grace and love. And our job is to receive it gratefully, as gratefully as our grandkids will receive their tennis rackets during this next week. Receive it like a child on his birthday. Oh, this is wonderful. Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favourite verses in the scriptures. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God's grace is a free gift. So going back to the question, the initial question, all good people get to heaven, right? Well, that young man in the story was a good man. And he walked away from Jesus forever. Those who get into heaven, it's not about being good. 
It's about receiving God's grace, isn't it? Receiving his, his forgiveness and our job is faith. Our job is faith in Jesus Christ. Full stop, nothing more. What a wonderful God this is. Praise his holy name.